Our circadian rhythm is the master clock that dictates what happens. And one of the major effectors of that circadian rhythm is light. You want to get as close to the sun as possible. Light really affects the human body. The population at large, we're spending 93% of our time indoors. Infrared light inside of buildings are becoming more and more scarce. Our incandescent bulbs, which used to give off quite a bit of light in the infrared spectrum, are now being replaced by LEDs, which give off no light. Many of the chronic diseases that we see in the world are heart disease, diabetes, obesity, inflammation, dementia. They're all highly tied to light. You need to get outside, get light when the sun is up, and you need to avoid light when the sun is down. We are finding out through studies that Dr. Schwalt, welcome. Thank you so much, Kristen. It's great to be here. So excited for this conversation. I think we're kindred spirits in that we both believe light is the path to human health and longevity. So I'd love to hear your thesis around that. I came into this late. I'm a pulmonary and critical care specialist. Um, when I joined a group, they said, no, you, you're going to need to know about sleep. You're going to have to train in sleep. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And you know, it's interesting. As I began to study more and more about sleep, those sleep journals became more interesting. Isn't it yeah. interesting how that works? It's so, it's so and cool. And <laughs> one of the things that I found was that sleep is highly tied to light, of course, and, and having light at the right time and having darkness at the right time. But there's something else about light, and we can talk about this as well, is that light not only affects us through the eyes, but it also affects us through the body. Our bodies are optical creations, and it's, it's quite actually very interesting. Um, you know, the way I divide it up in my head in terms of the, the divisions, there's the effect of light on circadian rhythm, and that's based through the suprachiasmatic nucleus and all of the things that, that are affected from that. And that's a whole topic right there. But there's also how light affects the mood. And that's a, that's a little bit of a different pathway. That's the perihibinular nucleus. Uh, it's a little bit different destination, but one that's actually very important, especially for people at high latitudes who get seasonal affective disorder uh, through the seasons. Um, then there's that third category, which is just mind blowing to me. And it's really exploding right now. If, if people are interested in learning about it, they can look at something called photobiomodulation. Um, that's one term that we like to use. Uh, basically, for me, it's just going out into the sun and getting the, the, the benefits of getting outside. Um, so those are the three areas that I think that light really affects the human body. I love that. Why don't we start with the timing of light? Yeah. I know there was a paper published in 2017, the timing of light affects brain circuitry and mood. I think it was done on animal models, but it suggested that viewing light between the hours of 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. has a pro-depressive effect and that it impacts the ne next day, dop the s dopamine system next day, motivation and reward. Can you talk about timing? Yeah. And, and why does this matter? So timing matters a huge deal. Just to sort of step back in terms of how important it is and how wide ranging it is. The schools of pharmacies are looking at this and, and pharmaceuticals are looking at this because what they're finding out is that they may have to do a lot of research to start over because the efficacy of the medications that they're giving and the side effects of the medications that they're giving, they never took this into consideration, but it actually may depend on what time of the day you're giving a medication. Because Kristen, you and I are different people at eight o'clock in the morning than we are at three o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm not just talking about being you know, fatigued after a long day of work. I could do a pulmonary function test on somebody at eight o'clock in the morning and I would get slightly but significantly different results than if I did it at two o'clock in the afternoon. And it's because our circadian rhythm is the master clock that dictates what happens. And one of the major effectors of that circadian rhythm is light. So this is huge. This is a huge deal. So what does light do? Um, it's interesting because the uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells in the back of our retina are not so sensitive in the morning, but they're extremely sensitive at night. And so it's a huge dichotomy. It takes you know, 100,000 lux of going outside to affect change in the morning, which is really important because what it does is it stabilizes, it it sort of sets the watch, if you will. In some cases, it may actually slightly advance your circadian rhythm, which may be actually something that is beneficial depending on what you do at night. If you're viewing light it's, earlier in the day, it's going to exactly. advance in that you're going to fall asleep earlier, right? So it's exactly. going to impact the release of melatonin. Exactly, exactly. Um, whereas, unfortunately, for us, especially living in the, the 21st century, they become extremely sensitive. These, uh, as you call them, the photosensitive retinal ganglion cells become even sensitive down to a photon of light that can activate them and shut down 
two, it does two bad things. Number one, it, um, it delays the circadian rhythm, messing up the timing, but it can also shut down melatonin production. I can't understate how important we are finding out that melatonin is. It's, it's actually the most powerful antioxidant that we know of. A lot of people are really gung-ho on glutathione. Check it out. Melatonin actually regulates glutathione. So, so it's the king of antioxidants. Let's yeah. talk about melatonin for a second, because yeah. I, I, I love that you pointed that out. And I think people, to your point, I think they see melatonin as this sleepy hormone. In fact, I don't think it makes us sleepy. It just um, is activated in the presence of darkness, yes. right? But I don't think melatonin itself is soporific, right? It has a very small it, effect. Right. Uh, th there are medications. It's the that, darkness that's yes. making us sleepy. It but, helps, yes. But melatonin yeah. has so many protective effects. If people want to fix their sleep, if they want to fix their hormones, if they want to fix just their mood, fix your light behavior, yes. right? And, and a part of that light behavior is protecting your melatonin, yes. right? So how do we protect our melatonin? And, and maybe just talk a little bit about the relationship between circulating melatonin and longevity. So this is really important to understand because when I get done, people will say, I'm just going to take melatonin tablets. And that's, that's not really the answer. So the, the issue is, is that melatonin, which comes on as, as the night progresses around nine o'clock or so. Only if dim light. If dim light, that's it. Like dim light right. melatonin onset, DLMO. Right. People um, need to know this. Right. So it gets, it gets released from the pineal gland, but it will not release if there is abundant light or even a small amount of light. That's why it's important to have your bedroom as dark as possible to put tape over those uh, clock radios, et cetera, et cetera, making sure that there is an ambient light from outside coming into your room. It'll shut down if you don't have darkness. So melatonin will then be secreted in through and throughout the vascular system. So that's blood melatonin. That's important to understand because we were able to discover this melatonin simply because it was in the blood. Remember we talked about at the very beginning where there's different types of light and how it affects the human body? We're finding out that there are orders of magnitude higher melatonin concentrations in the mitochondria itself which is there to help out with oxidative stress, just to sort of give you why that's so important. First of all, mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell, yes. What people may not realize is that many of the chronic diseases that we see today in the, in the Western industrialized world, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, inflammation, dementia, they're all related to each other in the terms that they're mitochondrial dysfunction issues. Right. I mean, not to mention yeah. infertility and, you know, I mean, yeah. the list goes on and on. The list goes on and on. So, the mitochondria, and it goes to this whole thing about mitochondrial aging, is that as we get older, the mitochondria produce less and less and less energy. And it's like an engine in your car. It produces heat. The heat could shut it down. What's the heat in the mitochondria? Oxidative stress. What is the antidote to oxidative stress? Apparently, it's melatonin. Why else would it be being produced on site in orders of magnitude higher than it's being secreted from the, mel from the pineal gland. Now realize this melatonin is now being discovered simply because it doesn't get out into circulation. It's harder to discover. You've got to go down into the intracellular organelles to find it, but it's there. In fact, here, here is nature's solution to the oxidative stress problem. At night, the solution is secretion of melatonin from the pineal gland. What's the solution during the daytime? It's not that. The solution is production of melatonin on site in the mitochondria. Now, how could you go about disturbing the situation? Very easily, either by exposing your eyes to bright light at night and shutting down melatonin production from the pineal gland, or not going outside and having melatonin not being produced. There's an issue that I need to talk about very briefly. We are finding out through studies, that there is a way of boosting melatonin production in the mitochondria on site. And that is through infrared radiation. People need to realize that more than 50% of the photons coming from the sun are in the infrared spectrum. So what does that mean? That means that you need, the bottom line here is that you need to get light when the sun is up and you need to avoid light when the sun is down. It's right. that simple. Right. When we zoom out and look at the population at large, I mean, we're spending 93% of our time indoors, right? So this is a huge problem. And if people are looking around, oh, what are all these, you know, we're cardiovascular and metabolic disease and, you know, cancer proneness and, you know, we're in an epidemic 
right now in terms of disease, right? And and I think we can safely say, and you tell me if this is wrong, but I think light is at the root. I think it's certainly one of many things at the root. And and I'll tell you why it's it's important, because we're not only like frogs going into the pot and the water is heating. We're, we're, we're First of all, more frogs are getting into the pot. And secondly, the water is heating up faster. I'll explain. A hundred years ago, we did not spend 93% of our time indoors. Uh, I'll, I'll date myself here and I'll say I'm a Gen Xer. I remember when my parents told me, come home when the street lights come on. So we were outside, we were playing. Um, I have kids and I can tell you that they would much rather be inside playing video games than, than being outside. So that's the first thing, we're inside more. But there's also things that are going on in terms of energy efficiency. So what's going on in terms of energy efficiency? Well, you know, our incandescent bulbs, which used to give off quite a bit of light in the infrared spectrum, are now being replaced by LEDs, which give off no light. Uh, it was considered to be a waste. It uses less energy. And in places like in Southern California, where I live, all of the windows have to be what they call low E glass. What this does is it prevents the heat contribution from infrared light from coming into the building, and it reduces the cost of air conditioning. So really, what we're finding is that infrared light inside of buildings are becoming more and more scarce, which makes it even more important that we get outside. You're a sleep a scientist, sleep specialist. When we talk about how to improve sleep, it's actually via our circadian rhythms, right? Yes. So we're not really, you know, yeah, cold or quiet. You know, there's all these sleep hygiene things that are, are really helpful to promoting sleep. But if we really, really want to fix our sleep, we got to address kind of our circadian rhythms first. So this entry point of light, um, I think that's amazing. So just within the first 20 minutes of waking up, you need to see as much light as possible, right? Get your eyes out into the sky. If it's cloud covered, it's okay, right? Yeah. It's just going to take a little bit long, longer to get to that 100 lux kind of Correct. So, so 100,000 lux is what you might get outside on a, on a very bright and sunny day. If you've got cloudy, it's still going to be brighter than staying inside. And we need we need that signal. We do. We do. So typically what we'd like to see is something called around 3,000 lux hours. What does that mean? That means if you're getting 3,000 lux, then you should be out there for an hour. Um, it's usually going to be 100,000 lux if it's a bright sunny day. And so therefore you could be outside for just a few minutes. But if you're inside where the lux is 50 to 100, you can see how long you're going to have to be inside before you would get that amount of light. It's not going to happen. What some people do if they live in areas where the sun doesn't come up before they go to work is they buy, you know, you can buy this online for about 20 bucks is a 10,000 lux lamp. You hold it between 11 and 15 inches from your face. And of course, if it's 10,000 lux, you only need to be in front of it for a third of an hour, 20 minutes and you're ready to go. So while you're cooking breakfast, or I'd, I'd recommend this for our shift, shift workers, exactly. you know, just to try to manipulate yeah. kind of their exposure and, and get enough, enough light at the right times. The way that our lives are right now is really to work against us. We have traffic in the morning that we have to get up early for. We come home late. We have a lot of homework, extra work that we have to complete that requires light, that works requires working on a computer, that, uh, that, that moves things forward. We don't get the benefit of going to bed early. And what's the first type of sleep that we get when we go to bed? It's slow wave sleep. And this is the best type of physically restorative sleep. And then of course we need to get up early in the morning. We're not getting as much sleep because we need to get on the freeway to get to our work because we live in places where housing is cheaper, but we want to work in places where the uh, cost of living is higher. So modernity higher. is just crushing us. It, 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 all of these things are yeah. pushing us away yeah. from health.